If you want to be debt free, that's great. Credit and debt are matter. equal. Yeah. They are not. Credit and debt do not have to be equal in any way, shape, or form. But we have to play the game to win it. Yep. You have to know the the rules and you have to play it to get you in the best position to get you the best money. Welcome to another cash flow company video. Today we're talking to a friend of mine, Alex. Alex, what are we gonna go over today? So first off, thank you so much for having me, Mike. I am so excited to be here today. I love everything that you do, that Cash Flow Company does. And today, after all of our conversations, we've really been stewing into what are real estate professionals and all of the ancillary companies and different um, supporting industries struggling with these days as we're dealing with this current economy and all of the things financial. So what I'm hoping we can talk about is how to leverage business credit instead of personal. Because I think so many of the people that we're talking to, both of us on a day-to-day -day basis, are putting things on their personal credit that maybe isn't working for them just as efficiently as it could. That's very true. I mean, I just was speaking to someone last week when we met a client of mine, and it's just like 70 to 80% of our clients. He's on eight projects. He's maxed out on his personal credit, looking to buy a truck, and guess what happens? His credit score goes down. It, it messes them all up. So I do, and I've always gone through it, thought about this is like, we need to make this more professional, more business. So the personal side is not impacted by the business side. So how do we do that? Well, I think that that's just the first thing is even acknowledging that we have a business. How many of the people that we're talking about, even though they are business owners, don't necessarily know or call themselves an entrepreneur? Let's talk about realtors. Let's talk about people in the trades, plumbers, electricians, people in flooring, people in renovation, all the contractors, the general contractors. Many of them still consider themselves to be employees because there's an overriding company. They don't necessarily look at the piece of they're getting a 1099, they're getting a check. They are their own company and they are the brand. Correct. And in another part of that, when I think about that, it's like, Taking it off, their personal credit is, is good for the credit score, but it's also as you build this business corporate credit, it takes it off of you being personally liable for, for most of it. And as you grow, you could actually get off all the PGs and build it into a real business that stands on its own. And a PG, to clarify, is a personal guarantee. Perfect. So we want to make sure that we are also talking through that. Now, where else is there a major problem with the with this specific topic that we're discussing? And that is social media, right? One of the things that you pride yourself on is the fact that you get to look at things as a human. One of the things I pride myself on is that I'm goal centric. How do we figure out how to get to the end goal by figuring out where you're actually at as an individual, not as a this big company or whatever else. And the majority of the content and the information around all of what we're going to talk about today is going to be on TikTok. It's going to be on Twitter. It's going to be on Reels. Yeah. It's going to be these little short form things that even though not all of it is bad information, it's not always complete information. So let's make sure that you and I are really bringing it full circle. In working with real estate investors, realtors, and contractors, a lot of it is, you brought it up, is we love to work human to human. It's that whole connection of how do we make them better as a person, as a company, because they're individuals, they're they're unique, and they don't all need the same box. They may even just need a little tweak here, a little tweak there. A lot of this is just fixing a few things and getting you on the right path. Absolutely. So let's start with what does that really look like? And what are we talking about? Like, what are some of the types of credit? What are some of the types of debt that maybe a lot of these business owners that truly are entrepreneurs and business owners are putting on themselves that maybe shouldn't be on their personal stuff. So let's talk realtors for conversation's yep. sake. Does that sound good? Oh yeah, we're okay. all part of the same team. <laughs> um, how many realtors are putting their open houses, all of their marketing, the listing photos, their materials, staging, all of that on a personal credit card? I think the majority. I would think the majority of small business owners across the board, I always say 70 to 80%, it's probably even higher than that, that we see have something on or all of it on their personal credit. And you're talking about realtors. How about contractors, gas? How about Home Depot? How about even their cars, their trucks? And it's all under their personal name instead of under, they may have a business name on the side, Yeah. but it's on their personal credit. I love that you brought up vehicles because 
it, this goes even further than just the credit. It's also eligibility. And the big thing about that is leverage. What does leverage really look like? We hear that term and we hear that vocabulary and, and we don't really know what that applies to each of us as individuals. So when I say leverage, it's how much are we eligible for and what does it look like on paper? The great thing about being self-employed is we get to write all this stuff off. I mean, we'll do the little disclaimer. I'm not a certified tax professional. Any tax advice I give you or possibly state here today, please verify with a certified tax professional before taking to be fact. That being said is we have all this stuff that we do for that benefit. And then we make this silly choice to go ahead and put our vehicle in our personal name that we're taking a tax write off on. Well, coming from the mortgage side, I'm sure you can speak to this way more efficiently than I can, is if somebody's taking a tax deduction for their vehicle, and then actually putting it on their personal credit, you're hitting them twice. It just makes it hard. It just makes it, even if they pay it through their business, it's just another step. It's just more work. These people need less work. They just need things to be a little bit easier. And to make it easier, they just need to take these few steps. So where's the starting point? People get so confused, overwhelmed with credit. It's it's one of those those kind of topics that people shut down instead of just moving forward. So I think we need to start to address that question even more expansively. And that is not just where do we start, but when do we start? And there's an adage out there or an expression, and I'm probably going to butcher it because I'm really good at doing that. And it's something to the effect of you should always get things before you need them because when you most need them, you're least likely to get them. Correct. I mean, like if you got lines of credit a year or two ago and this the, everything tightens up, you're a lot better than people trying to get them now. But people can get them now. It's just, yeah. you have to be a little bit shinier, you know, like personal credit. Yeah. And to me, that's the starting point with, with all these people, even though they're moving to business, the starting point always starts with me, with personal credit on the migration over to business credit. So let's start with that. A lot of the misinformation on the internet is that you only need a 640 or a 660 or even a 680. And nobody really hones in on which score are we looking at. So let's start there. One of my favorite web reporting sites is myfico.com. The reason I like myfico is actually because you're going to get 40 different scores. For the average consumer, they're going to log into this thing and go, I don't even know what I'm looking at. Too much. Yeah. yeah. Information overload. But I really like it because we can say, okay, in a mortgage, we are going to look at FICO 5, 4, and 2. And we're going to look at that very first 5, 4, 2 version. And it's going to be spot on anything you would see on a mortgage side or any banquet. Then if we're looking at from a auto standpoint, we're going to look at FICO 8 or Vantage scoring model. Those are going to be the two models that we want to look at. If we're looking at credit cards, we're going to look at the bank card score. All of those are going to be available on my FICO. And that's a great point because if someone goes to Credit Karma or one of these other sites, they're not using the same scoring models as your lender. So by going to my FICO, just happens to be the company who creates or produces the FICO scores. So why not go to the source? And it's just super clean to read as well, as far as what the recording is. And after you pay for the initial $29 report, you don't have to keep paying in anything on a monthly basis. And here's the other thing that I really like. They're not in it to sell you. They're not going to spam you with 20, 30 emails a day telling you here to build your credit, do this, to clean this, do this. They're not going to sell you. So the odds of you making a false step that you didn't intentionally mean to are super, super mitigated. Okay. So we're going to start with looking up your credit, your credit score. We're going to look, make sure we're using the right scoring models yeah. going through my FICO. And we're going to want to ideally see ourselves personally on the bank card score on that reporting at above a 680. Really ideally, especially in today's economy, as these banks keep tightening up and they're looking at their liquidity, we're going to really want to see ourselves above a 720. Yeah, and we see that, we've seen that over the last six to nine months in the mortgage and the, the lending world. It used to be a 640, that was a 660, now it's a 680, but you really need a 720. As you go up, as you get a better credit, more doors open. At this time, you need to really focus on your credit score. Two or three years ago, you just went, you know, maybe if you had a 640, it just meant you went from a 3 to a 4% interest rate. No big deal. Now it means you go from a loan to no loan. 
Absolutely. And then also even more so for investors, I would think. Like there's just all of these different overlays and components yeah. to contend with. You know, because investors, wholesalers, they're all looking for credit cards. They're all looking for ways to fund things. Leverage is king in real estate. But the whole community of contractors, realtors, all of these people are looking for the same thing. Funding for any kind of business, if it's real estate, if it's contract, if it's a realtor who's doing it open a house, they all need some kind of leverage to yeah. grow. And that's, to me, like where they start is a personal side and then build it. Yep. To so business. ideally on our personal, we want to be between a 680 and above. And really in that true happy spot is we want to be above a 720. Now, here's the good news is getting from a 680 to a 720 is actually one of the easiest jumps we can make. And it's much easier than trying to get from a 540 to a 740. So what are a couple things that you run across or what you see that would help someone go from a 680 to a 720? I know we've talked to before about getting authorized and stuff like that. We do like a 911 loan, but there's also just, you know, like if you have one or two little items, you can usually take care of them in a shorter period. Like what are a few of the things that they could actually use to increase their score? First and foremost, this is not the time to open new credit unless you've specifically talked to someone and they've given you a step-by-step -step outline. Don't buy in online. Don't let the internet tell you but that opening more credit, getting more of a mix is the answer because it's not usually in this range. That's first and foremost. Secondly, any old derogatory information, now's the time to see what can be done about it and leverage it. Especially if it's a local bank, especially if it's something from three, four, five years ago that's already got a zero balance, paid off, was that one-off fluke, the odds of getting a letter of deletion, the odds of getting it fully removed are so much better than they've ever been and doing it methodically. The third thing, inquiries. If you've already been shopping for money and you already have been applying for different things, looking at a fast inquiry removal is going to make a substantial positive impact. And I know from going through some other things is like using your personal credit, because I have, to get a business credit card had an inquiry on my personal credit. But since no new credit was established under my personal name, I could go and dispute that inquiry. So if you're using your personal credit to build your business, those inquiries should all be disputed, right? Correct. Yeah. And even more so too, when we're talking just day-to-day -day personal usage, like this is something everyone should be aware of. If you're going into the car dealership, the car dealership does not legally have permission to pull you 1,400 times. Which they do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, they're going to shop you. They want to know how they're making the best money. Yep. So don't go out and start looking for new credit right now. Yes. Make sure your credit score is there. We're at like the 680 to 7, moving at the 720 plus. What are some of the other things that people should be looking at in this current environment to make sure they're getting the best funding? Relationship, relationship, relationship. Good point. <laughs> Let's be real here. Who are the companies that are either having the hardest time and who we're going to see tighten their belts or are the companies that are going to look at it and go, you know what, you're just too small of a fish. It's going to be those big guys. And I won't name names because yeah. that's just not what we're here to do. Yeah. And you guys all know which ones I'm talking about. The more that we can build relationship, local, human, real, the better we're going to be. So with local banks, local credit unions. Business banks too. Yep. It's so important. And, and not just from a tax standpoint. Cool. I, we can talk about what different CPAs it will advise, what the IRS will advise, what all of them will have to yeah. say about it. And none of them are wrong. Yep. However, I'm not any of them. There's something to be said for if you run all of your transactions through a business account, even if you pay yourself out of it, you're still correctly creating the picture that people want to see. And that's what we have to remember, whether we're talking about personal credit, business credit, leverage, banking, relationship, is who's reading this book and what are they reading? Yeah. It's like a picture book with no words. So only their personal experience can actually dictate how they're reading that book and that story. So what does that look like? That screenshot in time on your personal credit is based off your statement closing dates. We want to do our best to pay all of our credit cards the day or two days before the statement cycle closing date to make sure that utilization is as yeah. low as possible. It's very easy to find that both on myfico.com or even by looking at the actual PDF statement. We want to leverage that next step and go, okay, 
if someone's looking at us as a business, if we're not depositing any money into a business bank account, if we don't have a business license, if we don't have a business phone number, if we're not an established EIN on some way, shape or form, then are we actually operating as a business? And all of this, all these things sound like they're monumental, but I mean, that's like getting an EIN, it takes minutes. Building and finding the banks that work with businesses and focus on businesses, you know, it might take a couple hours, but that's about it. And understanding what they want. I mean, if you put deposits in a bank mm -hmm. and you keep deposits in a local bank, they're more likely to approve you for lines of credit, for their credit cards, for all those things. For their vehicles. Yeah, for vehicle. their vehicles, they're for the vehicles. properties. Mm -hmm. All of these things are there. It'll be easier for you if you build the local relationship. So being local and knowing who you're banking with is vital. And the best part of that too is that the smaller regional banks, the business banks, don't have the same guidelines that have to be published, hard and fact, boxed lines. Yep. They actually have the ability to do make sense deals when they make sense. Yep. And I always look for growth banks. There's always some bank out there who's looking to grow <laughs> and they're looking to expand. And if they, and that means they're going to look at a lot of different companies, entities, and to try to approve them, try to get more loans, more growth, so they can either expand to either sell or, or buy. But there's always a bank who's trying to grow, and there's ones that are kind of just happy where they're at. So you got to shop around. You do have to talk to a few of them just to see what products they will offer. Because if you're in real estate, you want someone who likes to work with real estate investors. And we want to be aware of that too when we form that business. Are we actually in the business of real estate or are we in property Great management? Point. Are we looking at building our own real estate portfolio? What is it that we actually do? So what banks are going to look at, in addition to your business formation, whether it's an LLC or a corp, whether you're actually operating as a business, is your NAICS code. And what this code is, is it determines what your industry is and your subcategorization. There's certain industries that the NAICS code is considered super high risk. And let's just talk from a overall old time standpoint. Gambling, liquor, drugs are all considered high risk industries. So we want to decide consciously what that code is going to be as we tenure our industry and tenure our business for business whoa, leverage. Whoa, whoa. What's tenure? Let's, let's... Okay. So ideally, a bank wants to see a business having been in business for at least two years. Okay. Just like on a traditional real estate transaction, the bank wants to see that you've had a job for more than a year. Now, there's all kinds of um, mitigating factors where if that's not the case, it's not the end of the world. Please don't feel by any means if you're just now getting your business licensed, if you're just now going through the proper channels of building out the business correctly for the EIN, for the classification with the Secretary of State, any of those things, don't feel like that two years is just you have to sit on hold because it's not by any means. No, you should be building it from day one, the relationships. You should be making sure you set it up correctly because the faster you get there, the better. And the better your, once again, your personal credit score, you could probably get a few of these things built out and some of the credit established to get there even faster. And then especially with real estate, let's think about what does that really look like? Like we were just talking about, you might be owning multiple properties yourself as well as being an agent, as well as staging for your client. So guess what? My personal advice would be start all three of those as separate companies. If you only use one and you shelf the other two, fine. But you're going to give yourself all that opportunity to be able to go to the bank and go, I have three separate businesses. I want three separate loans. I want three separate credit cards. So three now separate lines and credit. Yep. I, I see a lot of that and I, I see a lot of the really successful real estate investors do that. They have like five or six different companies with one bank and they all have lines of credit with them, like unsecured lines, bank cards, more mortgages or whatever it may be. They just open up more leverage, more available. It doesn't mean you have to use it. Yeah. It just means it's available when things come up. And that's part of this whole thing is, is making sure in this kind of time, you know, you can open all the doors that are out there. Yeah. I mean, let's just, let's be real. What happens if you have a property that now all of a sudden sits vacant for a year? Do you want to take equity from the other properties or is there a better way to leverage? One of the better ways to leverage is if you have 10 other properties and each one has its own LLC 
and you each one has a line of credit, great. Each one of the other properties now makes one mortgage payment for 10 months and you're not sitting in a bad bind. Exactly. So let's go through because, you know, real estate investors, contractors, they're busy. They're like, how do we do all this stuff? Because it does sound daunt daunting, you know, like all of these like EINs and we have to set up everything correctly, even the naming of it. I mean, everything I hear, the research I've done is like, if it's real estate investing, don't put that in your name. Yeah. Make it a management. But how can they do, I mean, like they don't need probably all of this because a no, lot of this people Let's break it down to just five things. Let's yeah. break it down to five simple steps that we can do to at least get started and get started correctly. And before we even do that, you could help them with some of this stuff, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Like if, if there's no box, you're like anybody <laughs> who needs some assistance or making sure it's set up or getting some things corrected, you get help with that too. Right? Absolutely. So Go step ahead. number one, we make sure that our personal credit is setting us up for success. That's it. Perfect. Whatever that looks like for each individual person, that's fine. So personal credit setting us up for success. Step number two is that we need to decide what our business is and how many we want. That That's just a nice, simple, rounded step. Number three, I agree with you completely. How do we name that business? I'm a fan of, from both long-term estate planning, I have kiddos, I know you have kiddos. I'm a huge fan of having at least one parent corporation as a parent myself, because then I don't have to amend my trust every year. I can simply reallocate shares to my kiddos. That's a whole other conversation and I promise we will have that one. But I like the idea of my main parent company being my company, being my family name. So for me, or like enterprises, great, that's fine. It has no direction, but it also has no risk. Yep. And I don't know, have you done that with yours? I have I have multiple, I have multiple DBAs. <laughs> I think the other thing I have seen, and as people go through this, especially in our business, people who do flips. So they do three flips a year. So they get 50, 60, 80 grand into an account three times a year. And banks look at it going like, I still don't understand that that's just too many lump sums, it is better for them to have a an account for their property. The 50, 70, 80 grand goes in there and then they have a parent company where every month 10 grand goes in of that. It smooths everything out for the bank. So you, guys, you have to understand how they think and what they do too. So having those multiple companies and multiple bank accounts looks better when you go to get financing, especially from the traditional side too. Yeah. And that's where like, the, the actual company, especially that starter one, can be as broad as we want to make it. And it's a good thing. Honestly, I think everyone should have some form of a company that is theirs. Yep. Okay. So we've got personal credit. Yep. We've got the idea of knowing that we have a company. Number three is establishing that company. And in that same establishment, as we're looking at the name, is also the EIN. So we're going to register that company through a secretary of state and make sure that it's operate. Now, ideal secretaries of state from a tax and overall advice that we probably see on the web is either Delaware, Wyoming. Nevada, or Wyoming. Those are the three states that it is ideal. Now, again, if you have one here in Colorado, if you have one in Oklahoma, if you have whatever, don't feel that that's bad, but you can always add an additional company in one of those three states from both tax shelter as well as personal liability mitigation. And there's companies out there who could help you with all of these things. And a lot of it's just tweaking a few things you already have, mm -hmm. like making sure you have the right bank, make sure you have EIN or even doing a DBA to change the name that you're you're working under and stuff too. So that's four, right? Yeah. So they got four of that. Yeah. Time. Okay. And then five is being clear on what your goals are. I okay. think that that's the best place to start. Because if we're not clear on our goals, if we don't know where we want to take this, then all we're doing is filling out checklists and making more work and it becomes daunting. Whereas if we can say, here's the goal, the goal is I'm going to buy five more properties this year, or the goal is I'm going to now make sure that I can scale my business and bring on two more employees or get that additional dump truck or side loader or whatever big piece of machinery it is. If that's a set goal, and now it's not just that the goal. The goal is to do it in my company name. And now we can work backwards from that because we can start looking at which banks offer that, which banks are going to be most likely to accept it, and how do we fit ourselves into their box. And even I know in the past we've got through even vendors, because if you're a contractor, 
like setting up an account, a charge account, different than a revolving account, like with Home Depot, with Lowe's, with a gas company. Those things will help you build business credit if you've, you do it right. Yeah. But just you know, make sure you're you're getting into these charge accounts that will help you grow your business and in the same time grow your business credit score or business score as you go through it. So if you know where you're going, you're not going to be adding all these different accounts that people you know go on like like Quill and everything else that have nothing to do with your business. Have a straight line. Well, I want to be really intentional yeah, with like, things that work for us, not that become additional work for us. Because <laughs> we want to get to the AD on the on the Dun, Dun and Bradstreet number, because yes. that opens up. And I love that you brought up the Home Depot and Lowe's, because guess what? It's it's interesting. From a retail, I'm going to go shop. They're the same company, okay. However, from a credit sense, Home Depot to offer a commercial card has to see almost a full year track record of having a business registered on a phone number. And having transactions and that has nothing to do with credit, but you have to have a business Home Depot access, like loyalty number almost, so to speak. Oh, wow. For a year. And they want to see certain amounts of transaction before Home Depot will allow you to even be eligible for the corporate account. Whereas Lowe's, if you pretty much have a business and it's registered with Secretary of State, we'll give you a grant. And that's, that's important to set these things up because... This helps the migration from the personal to the business because we're trying to build, just like we did over here, personal credit. We're trying to build business credit that will open up more doors, more, even on the real estate side, someday getting a non-recourse loan on your building or a property. You have to, on the business side then, build that. And all these little tricks will get you there. And here's another piece to that, which I think is kind of a great place for us to almost wrap this up, is... We have to remember that not only we have to have a goal, but the more times that we feel a level of success with these processes, the more likely we are to continue. The more readily we're going to go ahead and build that second company, third company, fourth company, and down the line is if we're actually feeling successful. So let's set ourselves up for winning situations and not for failure. Yeah. And I think a lot of people credit uh, math, all these things, it's just <laughs> just not their thing, but it's important, especially in real estate. I always say real estate is probably the most leveraged industry out there. You need other people's money. You need loans. You need debt to buy properties, to fix up properties. So you need to work on your credit. We had for 10 to 12 years, we had the best time. Rates kept going down. Credit score requirements kept going down. Things have changed. We have to change with them. We have to change with the new guidelines. And that's what it's about, is just setting it up correctly, taking the steps to get there, and the quickest steps. In 30, 60, 90 days, how can I be better? Yeah. And always before you're needing the funds. Yep. The sooner we start, the sooner we get this stuff moving, the better. Because I can't even begin to tell you how many business owners I talk to on a weekly basis that are now trying to scale and now needing inventory or creating their own product that they want to white label or whatever else it is. People in the medical field that are coming out with new product offerings, people in the commercial trades that we were talking about that want to go to that next level and need more machinery and equipment to be able to scale are looking at how to get bonding, doing all these things. And they're coming to me and going, okay, I've read Dave Ramsey. I'm gold. I paid cash for everything. Now I need to borrow $2 million. And I'm like, so you're going to hate me. Guess what? You need to go open five credit cards personally. Yep. If you want, (laughs) if you want to play the credit card game, the credit game, the leverage game, you need to create a leverage profile, which is the credit reports, the DMB and all that stuff. If you want to be debt free, that's great. Credit and debt are not equal. They are not. Credit and debt do not have to be equal in any way, shape, or form. But we have to play the game to win it. Yep. You have to know the the rules and you have to play it to get you in the best position to get you the best money. We want to succeed. We want to grow. We want to make it easy. That's what we're talking about. So how can they reach out and talk to you and, and find out what steps? You know, I know you have a checklist. You have an audit. I don't like to use the word audit, but you have this little <laughs> thing that you could say like, Here's where you're at. Here's where you want to go. Here's the three or four steps yeah. you need to do. So I can be reached on any of my social media channels. And as well, what we'll do is probably put a link for both yeah. of us. Yeah, below. well, I'll put a link below yeah. because our whole goal here is to get you into the best 
funding the best situation because they succeed, we succeed, and that's what we're looking for. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Alex. Thank Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mike.